Okay, thanks very much. Um, great, so I, my name is Sarah Law, um, and my piece is called In Praise of Liminal Time, and I'll, um, I'll start off reading the first, uh, the first page, first few paragraphs. I write in praise of liminal time and of the limitless riches it can offer. First, a confession. As a poet and chronic misfit, liminality is my preferred territory in life. Liminal places such as the coastline or the porousness of sacred ground. Liminal careers slipping in between full-time academia and the restless writer's life. A liminal life, a long time solitary though married for the last 10 years. An only child without children of my own. My childlessness makes it harder to mark the passing of time as I move towards later life. The children of friends mushroom from infancy to young adulthood in what feels to me like a collapsed turn of a kaleidoscope. Years can slip by very quickly, especially after one's half century. The pandemic has only exacerbated this sensation of time's exponential slide. As my aunt, now in her late 70s, but who I still think of as a glamorous woman keen on red wine and rock music, confides to me, the years now pass by like months. Moreover, the finite nature of the human span is very much more apparent. With a slight further defocusing of my perceptions, I can view the term of a human life itself as little more than liminal. about the passing of time so it's one of these big abstract concepts that concerns all of us um, and uh, maybe has come to the fore and not not just through getting older now I'm now I'm getting older um, but through the last strange couple of years you know the pandemic the pandemic years which has kind of initiated um, a slightly different sense of time for me and for um, some of my friends um, people I've spoken to time seems to have gone very, very slowly, but slid past, um, you know, without those punctuating marks of the day um, and the and the month and the, the, the kind of rituals and seasons of the year being marked um, in their usual way. Haven't had the holidays. Haven't had the the sort of regular meetings and meetings up with people so it, it's kind of um forced to the surface uh this this reflection on time so it's a widely abstract concept but it's also a very personal concept um and my hope in that essay was to, to kind of blend the two um in a way that would uh let me come up with something that was a little bit new but hopefully relatable to Well, I wanted to challenge myself, really. It's, it's notoriously difficult to write about abstract concepts like time and, um, I don't know, love and fate and um, uh, happiness, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I wanted to challenge myself to uh, to meet these big um, concepts or unanswered questions in life to an extent um, with some of my personal experience, um, lived experience, but also my cultural experience for, for want of a better term things I've read about maybe taught uh maybe discussed you know in an academic or non-academic concept and you kind of blend those two together so that was my main idea is that it was a kind of self-challenging really but also um a bit of a bit of fun well maybe not fun but, but a sort of creative challenge one that I would enjoy meeting and and, and also um, to see what I came up with in a way, um, because I think the essay form in particular, uh, you can um, not always know where you're going. Um, and you can, if you're dipping back into your own memory, your own time stream, as it were, you can come up with some really vivid ideas and images that you, you, you're not consciously aware of before you do that. Um, Yes, I was thinking about that. I think the title of essay <laughs> can be a bit daunting um, because if you're anything like me, you think back to school and you think, oh, no, I've got to write an essay. I've got to plan it carefully and, and uh, polish it and, uh, you know, um, make a convincing argument. And um, although those things help, um, the essay form 
um, now is is really wide and generous and forgiving, um, and and therefore quite inspiring. So um, I would say that the initial challenge is putting aside those uh, the fear of those um, academic conventions, um, and and really allowing yourself to digress a little bit. Um, and then when you've done that, when you've done the digressing and the um, the sort of memory excursions and the, um, the conceptual ideas, then you can pull back and edit and trim and, and sort of see where your thoughts and the thread of the essay was going anyway. So put your fears aside, I would say, um, and, and just go forth and, uh, and write. Yeah, um, it, it, in a similar way, um, I would say don't worry too much. Um, I think it can help uh, not to do a rigid plan so much, but to, uh, to, to bullet point some ideas, you know, to jot down some ideas of where you want to go. And, and at that stage, um, you may find that your um, your thoughts and your memories start to kind of uh, tumble around and you can pull some out um, and so on. But a few bullet points. So you, you feel you've got some, some ballast there to get going. Um, but at the same time, don't be tied to it. As I said, the essay form the sort of contemporary essay form is is very forgiving actually so if you if your memories uh, and your thoughts start to push you in another direction then go with it um you can always revise you can always cut uh you can always copy and keep for the next essay if you feel it doesn't um quite uh, um belong in the in the essay that you're currently working on um but minimal planning and um a big leap of confidence i'd say creative confidence Yeah, uh, well, there are there are many out there now. So first of all, I'd I'd um, suggest a good browse of uh, online literature and um, newspapers, magazines, and so on. But um, there are there are some some really strong names. Um, so uh, Umberto Eco, uh, for example, I know he's a novelist and a sort of um, critic philosopher, but his essays are great too. Uh, Rebecca Solnit, very very good contemporary essayist, um, engages with uh, the political, the, the critical the personal um, and place-based writing as well, all of which are, um, uh, are really interesting. Um, Joan Didion, a, a very, very fantastic, great essayist um, who we've just lost, sadly, but her writing is is um, definitely worth immersing yourself in. And then, uh, and then I think it's a question of um, considering what sort of essays, uh, what sort of creative non-fiction you want to find out about. So if you like writing about place, then you could explore... Um, the, the sort of the subgenre of psychogeography, you know, place-based writing that allows reflection on personal memory and history and culture and all sorts of things. So you can find your way. There's there's, there's vast uh, vast landscape out there. Oh yeah. Um, well, um, I'm a poet, so um, I'm I'm always uh, dipping into and writing poetry. So um, I've got some poems coming up in um, in the Wind Hover magazine. That's a US magazine, uh, and hopefully um, another collection. Um, I'm also. Uh, having my first no novel published later this year by uh, a US publisher called Whip and Stock, um, and that's a novel called Sketches from a Sunlit Heaven. Um, and I work for the Open University, which um, which is a great privilege. Actually, I teach on the on the um, postgraduate, the MA um, course, and I I um, get as much out of it as I, as, <laughs> as I think the students do. You know, great readings and discussions and so on. So um, finding some way to keep keep reading, writing and discussing, um, uh, I would recommend. And that's what I try to do as well.